to say that it's very, very exciting for me to be reading here because, as Ellen knows, uh, a fellow author of my, a friend of mine, Savita Kalhan, and myself, we come in here regularly and we tweet about coming to Buzz Cafe. This is our literary venue. So we sit here in the corner moaning about, you know, like I've got this contract or that contract I'm not selling. So it, this, is my, this is my sort of local literary cafe. So uh, I'm going to read a, a couple of poems from my collection, Cutting Pomegranate. Hell's Angel Wrinkly. He offered me a ride on his Harley Davidson, feet forward, eyes skimming tarmac, its ponytail streaked with grey. <coughs> but I wasn't into risks then, the kids still small, hands held tight at crossings, fragile bodies strapped to seat belts. Later I waved them off, one day bus passes, Oxford Street. Back home, marooned, I could not map intention. I went, rarely sent a postcard home. My mother cheered me on. Dad still grabbed my hand at curbsides in my twenties. <laughs> and now, I'm in my sixties, I wish he was still around to do it. <laughs> so I hope you all remember the eclipse. We were right in the zone of totality. It was the most extraordinary one and a half minutes of my life. I didn't care, I didn't see the sun, the darkness alone at 11 o'clock in the morning was like out of this world. Oh yeah, I just asked you, do you want us to clap in between or at the end? Clap in the end. Save your hands. <laughs> Total eclipse. We are so old in that minute. Cave dwellers, without sun, hope, tumbled onto a planet strange umbilical cut, our bodies painted black, absence of colour, light, heat. We are naked, equal with the birds. God may call our name, we may respond, our minds scrambled in disbelief. Then light returns swifter than dawn. I see my son looking like my son, and the earth looking like the earth, tears dry on my skin. And when I was at school, I was the only Miriam. Everyone was called things like Lindsay and Helen and that, but I was Miriam. Nobody else was called Miriam. And I didn't have a friend who was Miriam. So the only Miriam I knew was in the Bible. So I thought I'd write um, a poem um, about her because pretty well the only thing she does, other than chucking Moses in the bulrushes, is she sings a song when they cross the Red Sea. And of course she sounds like a young maiden, but if you work it out, Moses was in his 80s, and she was about 12 years older, so she was 92. <laughs> and she's like doing this, you know, this tambourine thing. So, but anyway, I imagine her as a young girl, and I thought, well, it'd be nice if she was my friend. Miriam's song. Afterwards, when she had toweled down, her tunic soaked with sea spray, torn a hunk of flatbread from her lover's pack, why not start a song? Bring timbrels to shake desert air, watch bodies float like pomegranates split open, seeds scattered on the water. Voice high as a pyramid, peak knitted in white blown cloud, she'd have a lot to say. How horse rider hit the sea, their arrogance locked in salt. Now it would have been good to follow her, gather manner, heads bent together, whisper at night in charmed circles, reach the promised land arm in arm, a rabble of giggling dark tan slave girls, scent of freedom on our skin. That's me and Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my daughter decided to go to Southeast Asia. My husband and I had never been that far. I was terrified. And I took her off to the Royal Free. She has all these injections, three for rabies. And then the nurse says, and if a monkey licks you, a monkey licking her, then you have to go and get antibiotics. I mean, I was beside myself. That's the monkey. Everyone in the Highgate poets, well, half of them, were really young. And they just laughed when they heard this poem. They just laughed and laughed. And what are you worried about? Okay, this is my poem about being worried. This is in the South Bank, it's quite a nice journal. Travelling east, down the hill from Whitestone Pond, spring has sealed green the horizon. St. Paul's tucked along the river, hidden now for months, Hampstead Heath, the magnificence of tree. 
She lounges in the passenger seat, flicking channels. Van Morrison on KISS FM takes her far beyond this winding road, my long-legged brown-eyed girl. Smooth skin tattooed deep, needle brimming goodness, rabies, typhoid, tetanus, wrapped up and bound for Southeast Asia, she has erected an internal shield. Fifty litre backpack leans without a care by the door. Next week, she will sleep beneath her impregnated mosquito net. Snakes hissing in the night. Avoid water, the saliva of monkeys. <laughs> she will travel a geography I have only read about. My wisdom outdated. Route maps no further east than Jerusalem. In a language without reference, she will ride north, trails bubbling, adventure, and just a text intermittent between paddy fields to link us. Will I hold my breath for weeks? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, this is the anthology of the Haggate Poets. Always proud to be in it. I've been in the Poets for nearly 30 years. Um, the fantastic. I can yell over that. It's a fantastic uh, group of poets. Um, I've always had this obsession since I was a child about the killing of Nancy by Bill Sykes in Oliver Twist. I think it's the worst murder in literature. And when Dickens used to read it out, people used to faint. And if you go back to the text, um, Afterwards, when you know Sykes hides his face, he's so horrified himself by what he's doing. And afterwards, he just walks out of London, walks and walks and walks, and he's in shock. So I've written this poem in his voice as though he's in shock. So it's very disjointed. Foulest and most cruel, the killing of Nancy. Unspeakable, oh shut the dog, take the sun and block it out, but not the gun. A blasted sound, if she cries out, if they hear. So beat down hard and hide your eyes. Beat down hard, club the head, smash and grab and hide your face. Too dreadful God to look upon. The coward way, the blooded bone, the pitted skull, the crumpled eye. Oh shut the dog, its scrabbled paws. This not her face beneath the rug. Um, this is one of them I think the better half's heard. It's about his son. It's called Snapshot. When he was 22. He's 31 now. Mothers might recognise this about sons who've left home. Snapshot at 22. I iron his shirt gratefully. Each crease flattened like a year of his life. Three in his talking cars. Eleven, and I must leave him at the corner. He doesn't need me for big school. <laughs> Seventeen, he's out all night driving. Twenty, a working man. He moves out, his bedroom door swinging in the breeze. But tonight, he gives me this moment. Hands over the new shirt, packed tight in all the pins to remove. One by one. <laughs> I thought mothers would recognise that one. Um, okay, I'm going to read a, a poem which um, is about my family name, which I don't have because it died out with the men of the family on my grandmother's side. So the name is Silverclang. And in this poem, um, I write about the origins of this name. Um, so the names, the, the Jewish families were given names. Um, when Austria took over Poland, and our family got silver clang, which means silver singing voice. And Mozart had a character called Mrs. Silverclang in one of his operas. So this poem is just, it'll tell you about my family and reclaiming the name. Mrs. Silverclang, Mozart, and the family connection. When Poland was in Austria, as the saga goes, they gave up family brands like family names, like cattle brands. My ancestors got silver clang, or silver singing voice. Did they realize its portent? I imagine her, a long lost aunt, too many greats to count, wavy hair, glittering eyes, 
My paternal family spread out across Poland, which was Austria, which was Russia, until the Shoah, too many dead to count. Music is the link. Mozart, his leading female, Madame Silberklein, the Schauspiel director, an aging prima donna. Where did he find her? Perhaps his Jewish seamstress, sewing ruffs on velvet suits for the Imperial Concerts, Old Vienna. Was she my great-grandfather's aunt? Wayward Mendel Silberklang saved his family from pogroms only to let them starve in Antwerp, 1910. He never worked, but sang for tips in the diamond bourse. Did she train him, this Mozart aunt, to swap bread for songs and kept him from his little daughter? Esther, my grandmother, with her glittering eyes, sang opera to lull my father to sleep, needle flashing in the angry dark, she lined furs to keep the wolf. Her younger brother changed his surname, the elder she cried a flood for, Louis, Auschwitz, 1942. Our fragile London branch flutters on without descendants, but my brother Louis, named for our dead great uncle, inherited his voice pure, the music line unbroken. Today I reclaim the name, if only in this poem. Granddaughter, great niece, Miriam Silver Klein Burke Halachme. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read this poem because I'm read it out before spending you. Uh, my synagogue is twinned with an emerging Jewish community in Kerch in the Crimea, and I visited it twice. Um, so I was in the Crimea last October, and then things have changed. Um, it's very, very difficult for us to judge what side everybody should be on over there. They have their own, it's a very complicated situation. But I knew the young men in the community, and I thought, gosh, what if they go out and fall foul of somebody? So my poem is very much. Um, you know, inspired by those feelings, and not really by what anyone should or shouldn't believe in this matter. Our twin. They cross the straits in minutes, set up roadblocks, faces masked, fingers on the trigger, old women at the waterfront, fishing for Crimean crab, turn their heads as soldiers march through Lenin Square, where we have sat so often. Little Kirch. Derelict shipyards red with rust along the old Soviet skyline. A forgotten town on the far eastern spine, there on the news with Simferopol. When a twin breeds in, a twin breeds out. Friday night in London, our rabbi says, tonight in Kerch they will say the same prayers as us. He starts the Ma Tovu, how good are your tents, O oh Jacob. My mind is with our twin, the men in Talit, the open ark, the children coming up to sing. Across the Crimea, arguments rage. Tata, Jew, Kramchek, Russian, Ukrainian, all have a view. My mind is on our young men, fire in their bellies, dark history in their thoughts. Let them be home with their mothers this Friday night, away from the soldiers guarding the Crimean moonlight. Thanks very much.